and welcome to another tutorial. Um, this one is about how to solve problems around Redox titrations. Um, I'm going to go through the basic process of how to do them and then I'll embellish it with a bit more information about how to tackle particular problems. So this video is particularly aimed at students who are covering the IB and it's for Unit 9 which is all about Redox. Whether you're SL or HL you have to tackle this and it's part of the application and skills which is all about a solution of a range of Redox titration problems. It's quite vague what they mean by that. It's, it's kind of nebulous and I think the reason why is because the actual process of doing the calculations is quite straightforward. So what they do is that they throw out a range of things and problems in order to embellish the problem to make it harder. And hopefully what this tutorial will do is support you a little bit with how to tackle these kind of problems because chances are you can actually do these things individually but it's pulling it all together which is the hard bit. Um, interestingly in the textbook on page 221 for the IB it says this type of question frequently appears in question one of paper two. It's going to come up, okay? It'll be, it'll, be, it'll be surprising if it doesn't. So this is something you do want to get pretty sharp at, all right? So why redox titrations? Why not just do a normal titration? Well, the reason are is that they work just like normal acid-based titrations, such as phenothaline and methyl red. If you remember phenothaline, in acid-based titration, your solution goes from clear to pink, uh, depending on whether you've added uh, enough base or not. With methyl red, it's a similar color change. Okay? It goes from red to yellow, again, based on the pH. Now, these redox titrations can also give color changes, although pH does not necessarily determine the color change, and that makes them really useful. Um, they can determine the concentrations of solutions that cannot be done with normal acid-based titration methods. And in a redox titration, you have a known concentration of an oxidizing agent, and that's used to find the unknown concentration of a reducing agent. So it's always around a redox equation. Um, now, the applications are, are numerous. A couple of good examples include the iron content of water or the vitamin C um, content of foods. So they are very, very useful. And chances are, if you're doing an IA, you would have thought about this at some point. So let's have a look at a typical problem. So a typical problem in redox would be something like this. Consider the following reaction between potassium manganate, that should be manganate, not manganite, and ammonium iron sulfate. And here's your equation. And here's a bit more information. In a titration, 24.5 centimetre cube, blah, 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 blah. And then we have to determine the concentration of the potassium manganate solution in grams per decimetre cubed. So, where do we start? Chances are, if you get a question like this, it's going to be really wordy, okay? It's almost going to be like a mini essay of stuff you have to plough through. They can be quite intimidating when you first look at it, but if you follow a few simple steps, it makes life a lot easier. Now, these are the steps I recommend. And if I were you, I would follow these to the letter. So, step number one. Balance the, <laughs> it says balance, but depends if it's balanced or not, redox equation if needed. Secondly, write out the equation triangle for titration calculations. I'll talk about that more in a moment. Thirdly, make a table with columns for the substance which you have the most data for on the left and the substance you're lacking data for on the right. Step number four, put volume concentration moles and mole ratio in the first column for each row. Step five, fill in the table with the data you have. Step six, use the triangle to complete the left-hand column. Step seven, use the mole ratio to determine the number of moles in the right column. Step eight, use the triangle to complete the right-hand column. And finally, step nine, convert concentration to grams per decimeter cube if you're asked to by multiplying the MR and vice versa. So, as you can see, it's just a range of stuff. And I think it will make a lot more sense when we do a couple of examples. So let's crack into the example that we showed before. So, here's the question which we had a look at beforehand. Now my first step, well, before I go into the first step, this titration is quite useful. The manganate iron has this lovely colour change where it goes from clear to pink. Not necessarily determined by pH, which is great. So, very useful. And let's think about what we have to do. Now the first step, which I mentioned before, was to balance the redox equation. Now you can actually see already that it's been given to you balanced already. So step one is done. Woohoo! We can move on. Number two. Write the equation triangle for titration calculations. I can't stress enough how important this is. Every time you do these kind of calculations, draw your triangle. 
Now, the triangle, if you're if you kind of don't quite remember from previous learning, it's uh, moles is always at the top, and you've got volume and concentration at the bottom. And I'll refer back to this a little bit later on. Step three: make a table with columns for the substance which you have the most data for on the left, and the substance you're lo lacking data for on the right. Now, I'll show you what I mean by that in the following way. So here's my table. And I have to think about what I've got data for and what I want to find out. Now, what I want to find out is the concentration of the potassium manganate solution. And this way you have to start reading through the question. I can see manganate solution. If I look back to my reactants, this is my manganate ion. So the information I want to find out is about the manganate ion. So I'm going to put it here. There we go. Now, the, the other substance which I've actually got information for is ammonium iron sulfate. Now that must refer to this. I'm not worried about the ammonium, I'm not worried about the sulfate, because chances are they're spectator ions. Their oxidation numbers don't change, they're not involved in the redox process, I can forget about it. So as a result, I'm only gonna focus on the iron bit, so I'm just gonna put Fe2+. plus. Okay, that's my next step. Um, and we're good. Next one. Put volume, concentration, moles, and mole ratio in the first column for each row. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. So I'm just going to put V for volume here, C for concentration there, moles here in M, and then I'm just going to put mole ratio there. And I'm just going to mark some lines off, and I'll be putting some numbers there in a moment. There we go. Okay, so always do this kind of table when you do this kind of calculations. You may be familiar with doing this from normal titrations. Next step, fill in the table with the data you have. Now, if you've got a question like this, underline those numbers. So, potassium manganate solution, I have 24.5 centimeter cubed. Now, potassium manganate is over here, so 24.5 goes into there. Now, because it's a titration, we always work in decimeter cubed because concentrations are always in decimeter cubed. So I have to divide this by 1000 which gives me 0 0.0245 decimeter cubed. All right, and that will come into importance later. I've also got the volume of my ammonium iron sulfate which is this. So it's 28.0 .0, which equals 0 0.0 a zero decimeter cubed. Notice I put the extra zero in there. That's just to maintain significant figures, which might be important later on. Another number, 0 0.200. This is the concentration. I can tell that from the units, and it's for iron sulfate. So I'm just going to put 0 0.200. I'm not really going to bother with putting units here unless you really want to. Well, yeah, let's put it in one. Let's go crazy. Okay, so there we go. Now we have to work out the moles. So use the triangle to complete the left-hand column. Now I want to work out moles. Have a look at my triangle and cover moles with my, my little cursor. It's volume times concentration. So effectively, it's these two numbers multiplied together. So 0 0.0280 multiplied by 0 0.200, and that equals, I'll just put on my calculator. Oh, hold on. So 0 0.028 times 0.2 and that gives me 0 0.0056. Notice I've written the calculation out. If you're gonna do the table, great. Don't use that as an excuse to not show your calculations. Always show your calculations, because then you can check that later if you made a mistake. All right, um, so that's that. Um, next step, use the mole ratio to determine the number of moles in the right column. Now to do this bit, I need to work out the ratio of moles for the iron and the manganese. Now let's have a look up here. I've got five there, and there's no number there, which is basically one. So for iron, it's five, and for manganese iron, it's one. Now that means that for every five moles of this, it reacts with one mole of that. Now I don't have five moles, I've got 0 0.0056, so I need to divide that by five to get the ratio spot on. So 0 0.0056 divided by five and that gives me 0 0.00112 moles, 
Okay? So that's that done. Let's move to number eight. Use the triangle to complete the right-hand column. So I have to finish this off now. I want the concentration and face it. That's what they want anyway. So to work out concentration, it's moles divided by volume. If I cover concentration here, moles divided by volume. So it's 0 0.00112 divided by 0 0.0245. Remember, decimeter cubed. So I divide that by point. 0245, and that gives me 0 0.045. Now, my calculator says 7142, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to do it 45, go away, 457, because I want to maintain three significant figures. And you put the units there as well, so it's mole, decimeter, cubed. Okay? So that's a standard one, and you can see that it takes a bit of time. Now, the IV board, I am convinced, I'm absolutely convinced that when they're writing papers, they look at this and they think, this is easy, this is very easy, let's make this harder, you know, wherever they do it. And they think, oh, what could we throw in? Let's throw in a mat, let's throw in this, let's throw in that. And they'll throw in all sorts of things to confuse you, okay? This is as good as it's going to get, I'm afraid. So now I want to go through some particular problems where they've had this group discussion, they've worked out how they want to make it hard for you, and this is what it's going to look like. So, um... Before I go through the horrors, I just want to quickly go through how to do grams per decimeter cubed. And this should be familiar from previous learning. To do grams per decimeter cubed, you have to multiply by the MR. Okay? So my concentration is this. It's 0 0.0457 moles per decimeter cubed. And to turn it into grams per decimeter cubed, I have to multiply by the MR. Now the MR is for potassium manganate, not just the manganate iron. So we have to work out what the MR of potassium manganate is. Before we do that, we have to work out what the formula is. Um, the manganate iron, I'm just going to write it here now, is, well, potassium is K+, plus, manganate is MnO4-, minus, bit of crisscross, you need one of each to have a balanced charge, so it's, just write over here now, KmNO4. You work out the MR of that, and it goes into here. And then it will give you the answer in grams per decimeter cubed. Okay? I won't go through the detail uh, at the moment because I've got uh, other things I want to talk about. All right, so moving on. Here's another question. Consider the following reaction between sodium oxalate and barium ferrate. Very, very nasty looking. Not as bad as it looks. In a titration, 18.5 cm cubed of sodium oxalate solution completely reacted with 15 cm cubed of a 0 0.05 blah blah blah. Determine the concentration of the sodium oxalate solution in grams per decimeter cubed, why not? Okay, now this is an example where you, you have to get the ionic formula first, all right? Um, so the first step, as usual, is to balance the redox equation if needed. This is slightly different. We have to work out what the redox equation is. To do that, I need to work with my, um, what my spectator ions are going to be. Now, sodium, group one, is always going to be plus one as an oxidation number. So I can forget that, and over that I can forget that. The sulfate ion never changes. Incredibly stable. It's always going to be two minus. No, nothing changes there, so I'm going to forget that, and I'm going to forget that. Just for the purpose of writing the um, redox equation, mind you. So... If I take away two lots of Na, which each one is 1 plus, that leaves this. It leaves C2O4, which has a 2 minus charge. All right? Let's have a look at this now. Now, bearings in group 2, which means it's always 2 plus. So forget that. Forget that. There's another sulfate. Forget that. I'm left with this FeO4. Now, if that's 2+, plus, that means that the ferric ion here must be 2-. minus. Right. Now, interestingly, this is an acid. If it's an acid, it's always going to donate H+. Plus. It's got 8 lots of 2 hydrogens, which is 16. So it has to be giving 16 lots of H+, plus in its reaction. Right. So that's my reactant side, and I'll do the product side just to complete this. So I've got Fe2... SO4-3. Now, SO4, as you may remember from Unit 4, is always 2 minus. To make this molecule work, it means that Fe has to be 3 plus. 
Notice I have two of them. I can't put a two there because that would imply it's a molecule and that's nonsense. So I'm going to put the two there and we're done. All right. I'll add the H2O and I'll add the CO2. And that is my balanced redox equation. Um, and that's that. So, the tricky bit now is to work out, oh, before I do that I need to work out coefficients, I've almost forgot. So there's three lots of C2O4 and I've got two lots of FeO4 minus. So charge wise, three lots of minus two is minus six uh, and you've got two lots of minus two is minus four, so minus, minus four minus ten. So you're left with a plus six on this side and you've also got two lots of three plus there which is a plus six on this side. So charge wise it works. That's just a quick double check to make sure you haven't made a mistake. So this is a classic um, illustration of how a question can trick you by asking you to do this extra step first. Now once you get there, everything else is exactly as it was. All right. So my next step is to write out the equation triangle. Remember moles are at the top, concentration of volume at the bottom. It doesn't really matter where they are. Ooh. Next step, make a table. Let's make a table. So here's my first line. Here's my next line. Bring that down. Now, I want to determine the concentration of the sodium oxalate ion. Now, this is sodium, this must be sodium oxalate because it's got sodium. So this must be the oxalate ion, which means that's the oxalate ion, which means over here I have to write C2O42 minus. Now the other substance where I have lots of information for is this 15 centimeter cubed of a blah, 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 of barium ferrate. Now the ferrate is iron, because it's ferric. So that has to be this bit, which is this bit. So I'm gonna put FeO4, two minus over here. Next step is volume, concentration, moles, and mole ratio. Okay, and I'm just gonna put the lines for it just to prepare my table. Uh, next step. Fill in the table with the data you have. Now I know that I've got 18.5 centimeter cubed of sodium oxalate, which is that. So it's 18.5, which we have to put into decimeter cubed, right? So 0 0.0185 decimeter cubed. I also have 15 centimeter cubed of the ferrite. So 15. I need to convert it to decimeter cubed by dividing by 1,000. So 0 0.015 decimeter cubed. I also have this as the concentration for my ferrite, which is 0 0.05. Now before I go any further, I'm also going to do the mole ratio. I can see that I have 3 moles of this for every 2 moles of that. So let's put that in 2. Okay? And then you go through the motions. Okay? Use the triangle to complete the left-hand column. Okay? So for moles, it's concentration multiplied by volume. So it's going to be 0 0.05, that's my concentration, and multiplied by my volume, which is 0 0.015, and that will give me 0 0.05 times 0 0.015, and that will give me 7.5 times 10 to the minus 4, and if I was being a bit of a badger, I'd make that to three significant figures, because all my numbers are in three significant figures as well, you can see. So that should be probably 7.50 times 10 to the minus 4. Now, to go from 2 to 3, there are a couple of ways you can do this. You can divide by 2 and multiply by 3. You can multiply by 3 and then divide by 2. Or, you can simply multiply by 1.5. So, it doesn't really matter how you do it. I'm going to do it by multiplying by 1.5, just because it's a bit more straightforward for me. And that gives me 0 0.001125 moles. So that's that. Okay. Um, now I need to complete the right-hand column, which is here. Um, so I've got my concentration. I need to work out concentration, which is moles divided by volume. So it's going to be 0 0.001125 divided by 0 0.0185. So let's pump that into the calculator. And it gives me 0. 0, 0.0608 um, and it'll be moles per decimeter cubed. Now remember, the question's asking you in grams per decimeter cubed, so final step is to multiply by the MR. Now the MR would be not just for this iron, but for this beast, 
Ignore the three when you're doing the MR, okay? Just for that. And I won't show that step, but I'll, I'll trust that you can do that on your own. But that's how you do it. Okay, so that's another example. Here comes another one. Calculate the volume of 0 0.0500 potassium manganate, which just reacts with 0 0.319 of iron sulfate, sulfate in acid solution. This is another nice question which sort of exemplifies um, a couple of issues which might come up. Issue number one you have to balance your equation first. And you can see here that the balancing is not right. Secondly, we have to convert this mass into a mole at some point. So first off, we have to balance the redox equation. Now, there's a few ways we can do this. Um, I'll do it in a way which is probably the most straightforward. I've got MnO4 minus plus Fe2 plus, And eventually, that's going to make Fe3 plus plus Mn2 plus. Now the first thing I can see oxygen is there, so I need oxygen on this side by adding water. So I need 4H2O. Um, to make everything balanced now, I need to sort hydrogens out. I've got 8 over here, I need 8 over there, so let's add 8H+. Now you might think after that, ha ha ha, I balanced it, aren't I clever? But there's a problem. You've got 8 plus here, plus 2 makes 10, takeaway 1 is 9. But here you've got 3 plus 2, which makes 5. So there's a disparity there, right? Because you've got plus 9 here and plus 5 over there. A couple of ways you can do this. By trial and error, you can count up the coefficients of these numbers, which will affect the overall charge on either side. Now, by doing it, you'll probably find that if I put a 5 here and a 5 here, that will change things a bit because now I've got 8, take away 1, plus 5 lots of 2, which is 10, and that equals 18, take away 1 is 17. Over here, I've got 5 lots of 3, which is 15, add 2, 17, it works. Now you might think, how the hell am I going to do that in the exam? You may be given that, where you have to do some trial and error. Alternatively, they're probably just going to give you the half equations, and the half equations for this, from my sort of sketchy uh, memory, is for the manganate iron, it's going to be that plus the manganate, uh, which gives you Mn2 plus plus 4H2O, right? That's one of them. And I think also there's a 5E minus somewhere, wherever that be, 8, 7, yeah, be here, 5E minus there. So that they'll give you that. And they'll also give you it for iron. And for iron, it's really easy. It's just Fe2 plus makes Fe3 plus plus E minus. Chances are they'll probably give you those two equations. All right? Now, if they give you those two equations, you'll see that you've got five electrons here, but only one here. So you have to multiply that by five. So you've got five there, five there, five there, and Bob's your uncle. You can then start blending them. So that's your first step. And I'm just going to erase all this jazz so I can now go through the, um, the, main, the main meat somewhat laboriously so as you can see okay I'm going to leave it there, alright I'll leave it there okay so now so now um, I'd like to go through the other bits of the calculation, not in as much depth as before because you probably know what to do from this stage. So I need moles, calculation and volume as my triangle, so that's there, good. Step three is to draw my table. So let's draw the table again. Um, now the information I've got, this is a bit trickier. Let's work out what I want to find out. I want to find out the volume of potassium manganate. Now manganate must be MnO4, so I want to find out something about this, whatever it may be. I've got the mass of iron sulfate. Now, iron is Fe2+, plus, so I'm going to put Fe2+, plus there. I'm going to go through the regular motions. I'm going to put volume, concentration, and moles there, and then obviously mole ratio there. And just put my lines through my table. And while I'm at it, let's do the ratio because we're going crazy. So, every, for every five moles of the iron, you can see there, it reacts with one mole of this. So the ratio of iron to manganese is 5 to 1. So I'm going to put 5 here and 1 here. Okay. 
Let's put some numbers in. So, left hand column. I have 0 0.319 grams of iron, but <gasps> there's no mass. I have mole, not mass. So what do I do? That's right, well done. I have to convert my mass into a mole. Now I've got 0 0.319 grams of iron sulfate. First off, we need to work out what the formula for iron sulfate is. Now if you think about it, iron 2 must mean it's Fe2+, which we've ascertained here. The sulfate iron is SO4 2 minus. So I've got Fe2 plus and SO4 2 minus. I'm, which means they, the charges cancel out. So I only need one of each. So what I've got then, I'm just going to write the bottom here, is Fe SO4. Now I'll need the MR of that because what I want to work out is the mole and I already have the mass. So the calculation we're going to do is mass divided by MR and that will equal my mole. Now my mass is 0 0.319. Now if I add together iron, which is roughly 56, I add sulfur, which is 32, and I add four lots of 16 for oxygen, which is 64, that gives me about 152. Now when you do this, you will have to use the, uh, the more precise numbers from the data booklet, but I'm just doing it with these rough numbers. So if I do 0.319 divided by 152, that gives me... 0.002098 blah 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 blah. Now that's my mole. And when you're doing calculations like this, you want to show that. Okay? Don't just do it in your head. Show your thinking. So that's my mole. Um, I've also got that's all I've got for it. Okay? So that I've done that. I've also got the concentration of my potassium manganate, and that goes here because that's my manganate iron. Here's concentration. So that must be 0 0.0500. OK, now I need to use the triangle to complete the left-hand column. Now, I can't actually do that because I haven't got any concentration or volume. I'm going to skip that for now. But now it's going to say, use the mole ratio to determine the number of moles in the right column. I know I have this many, and I know the ratio is 5 to 1. So to work out the number of moles on this side, I have to divide by 5, because it's going to be 5 to 1. So 0 0.002098 divided by 5, which gives me 4.220 times 10 to the minus 4. All right? OK. Um, now, it wants me to work out volume, which is now unoccupied. To work out volume, if I go back to my triangle, it's mass divided by concentration. So it's this number. Divided by my concentration, which is 0 0.05. And that gives me 0 0.00839 um, decimeter cubed. Okay, just make sure you get your units right. So you can see we've gone through two different skills here. The first one was the balancing equations first, which was tricky. The second was master moulds, which we covered there. So those are two other ways in which the IV might try to trip you up. Just be savvy and wary that that might come up. Let's try one more. We don't do others other steps. Um, here's another one. This is my final example I'm going to do with you. A 1.74 gram ring containing an iron salt was shaken with dilute H2SO4, blah, blah, blah. Use this to calculate the percentage by mass of Fe2+. Now this is an example where they might ask you to find the amount or percentage of something, particularly before and after. Now I'm going to focus on the percentage of something in something. Um, so first off, I have to decide the balanced redox equation. Now, my students before have said, how the hell are we supposed to work it out from this? And that's a really good question. Chances are they will give you the equations in the question. If they're feeling particularly mean-spirited, and I don't think they will, Instead, what you can do is go into the data booklet. Now, if you go into section 24, you'll see a list of standard electrode potentials, and you'll also see some equations. It's the equations you want to focus on. HL will be familiar with it, SL won't. It doesn't really matter. The key thing is you need to focus on the equation side. Now, because I've done this a million times, I know that um, Fe2 plus is going to turn into Fe3 plus in a very straightforward equation, which is this. Okay. Um, I also know that 
let's have a look at this carefully. I've got potassium manganate iron. So this is very similar to what we've seen before, okay? So we've got manganate iron, which is MnO4 minus, and that's going to turn into Mn2 plus. And this is literally the data book bit, so you don't have to like magically remember this. You can work it out, like four lots of oxygen, so I've got four H2O here, I've got eight H plus there, um, and let's work out the electrons. I need five electrons on this side to make things work. Okay, so in order to make the two balance out, if you remember from our previous example, I need five of these so the electrons cancel. So effectively what I've got then is, I'm going to write it in quite small here I'm afraid, but it's going to be 5Fe2 plus add 8H plus add MnO4 minus and that's going to make 5Fe3 plus add Mn2 plus add 4H2O and that is your balanced redox equation. Um, so you may be asked to do that from the from the off which is a bit mean but um, you know could could come up. Um, so there's my redox equation. Now let's work out what I need to do. First step is to write the equation triangle out. Moles is always at the top as I know, concentration volume at the bottom. There's my triangle. Next step, make a table. So let's make sure my two columns on the right have lots of room. Uh, and that's my other one. Oh, before I do that, I need to fill in um, the two substances. Now, I want to calculate the percentage of my mass of Fe2+. So that's what I want to find out. And notice mass and percentage. We'll tackle that in a moment. Really good problem-solving question, this. On the left, I've got information on potassium manganate. I can see those two numbers if I look carefully. So it must be MnO4 minus. You might notice that with this, I'm always looking at the reactant size, and that's probably the most important size for these titration problems. Okay, so next step. Put volume, concentration, moles, and mole ratio in the four rows. And I'm just going to draw my rows out for tidiness. And then I have to fill in the table with the data I have, okay? So I've got... Let's have a look at this very carefully. I'm going to ignore this for now because this is not relevant. It says the resulting solution required 25 centimeter cubed um, of potassium manganate. So here's my potassium manganate. So I've got 25, which equals 0 0.025 decimeter cubed. Um, and I've got the concentration as well, which is 0 0.0200. I've also got. That's all I've got, actually, I think. Okay, that'll work. Um, I'm also going to fill in the mole ratio while I'm here. You'll notice that for every five ions, there's one manganese. So manganese is here, that's one, iron, five. So to work out moles, let's go through the process again. So moles equals concentration times volume. So concentration is 0 0.0200. I multiply that by 0 0.02500, and that equals... Just put in my calculator. So 0 0.025 times 0 0.02, and that equals 5 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of that. Now, because it's a 1 to 5 ratio, following this step, I now need to times it by 5. So 5 times 10 to the minus 4 times 5, and that gives me. 0 0.0025 okay now it then says for my next step use the triangle to fill out the right hand column now let's think about this really carefully uh, have I missed any information out I've got that, I've got that the percentage by mass of iron in the ring I've got the moles but the question is do I need volume or do I need concentration to work out mass the answer is no. So this is one of those questions where your problem solving ability really gets tested. You don't need this. So I'm going to ignore it and I'm going to concentrate on actually what the questions are asking me. This is a good framework. Don't care about relying on it too much. So let's work out. Um, how do I convert moles into mass of iron? Well, I know I've got 0 0.0025 moles. 
I want to convert into mass, I need to multiply it by the MR, which in this case, only for iron, is 55.85. That's the value from your data booklet. So I multiply by 55.85, and that gives me 0 0.139625 grams. So that's how much iron I have in the ring. Now, what's the percentage by mass of iron in the ring? I've got this much. The total ring weighs that much. So in order to work this out, I have to divide. I'm just going to do up here now. So apologies for the confusion. But it's one. Oh, it's the actual mass of iron, which is 0.139 dot dot dot, divided by 1.74, which is the mass of my ring. And that gives me... 0 0.0802, which is effectively 8.02%. Oh, sorry. So what that means is that my little ring, only that much of it is made of iron. The rest of it is hopefully made of more precious metals like gold or whatever you like. So there you have it. That's another type of problem. Um, so that's it. Now, for some general tips of how to tackle these problems, and this is what's helped me in the past, um, they're usually part of stepwise larger problems. So if it's going to be in question one, question one's probably going to be several parts, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Just take your time, and eventually it'll be one of these calculations, and it will take you to somewhere else. They like to scaffold the questions. I think they've realised that just putting an eight marker doesn't really rub well with a lot of students. Finally, don't get thrown by wordy questions. So you've seen that they can get very long in the words. Just take your time deciphering what they want. If it, if it means you have to underline words, then so be it. Trust in the table and show your calculations, okay? You can see that for me, the table works really well. It's worked really well for a lot of students. I recommend it for you if it works for you. If you have a different way of doing it, the textbook shows a different way, which works for some, go for it as well. Um, and just be aware of equations where the ions aren't shown explicitly. Remember what I said before, you might have to go into the data booklet to do it. You may not, who knows. Um, just, be, just read the question and work out what it wants. Okay, thank you very much. I hope it's been helpful. Um, please write down a comment or two if you found it useful.